You're muted. Your mic's off. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Mili Takarani Mraudzi. Um, I am a board member of the Documentary Film Makers Association, as well as co chairperson for South African Screen Federation. Um, today, we're going to be engaging with um, amazing, amazing panelists on, on funding during COVID times, but we will also take it to funding overall. Um, because there's, there's always questions around funding and there's always a need for clarity around funding. Um, I'm going to allow my panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Desmond, then Jackie, um, then Kirsty will follow, Unati, then Yolanda. Um, not going to interrupt the inter introductions. Desmond, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Desmond Timtembu. I'm with the Gauteng Film Commission as the senior manager in the industry development uh, unit. Thank you for having us. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jackie Mutsipe. I'm the chief uh, operations officer at the KwaZulu Natal Film Commission, and we're based in Durban. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kirsty Blackford. I'm the temporary head of um, industry development at the NFEF. Uh, I actually joined them during lockdown in May, so I'm relatively new. And, and um, thank you for being a part of this panel. Good afternoon, everyone. I know the feeling, Kirsty. My name is Unaiti Malunga. I am the executive officer of the South African Screen Federation, SASFED. Thank you for having us. My name is Yolanda Nzubatana. I'm the production and development manager at the National Film and Video Foundation for documentaries. Thanks everyone. Thanks for introducing yourselves. Um, we, we're talking funding today and I think what is what is easier to make this conversation flow is for us to start with the funding models that exist. Because if we were to skip directly to COVID funding, um, we wouldn't be doing this topic any justice. Um, I'm just going to start with um, Jackie. Um, what, how is the KZN Film Commission funding model structured? And, and, and please feel free to talk across all levels in terms of funding? What is it that you fund? Who do you cater for? Um, uh, and, and if you want to go into caps or tires, go ahead. Let's just let this flow as easily as possible. Jakey? Thanks, Millie. Um, so the KZN Film Commission Fund, um, it's a fund that, uh, that really um, funds across all genre, all types of films. So from features to documentary shorts to, to most forms, um, television series as well, we fund, we also fund reality. Um, because we are based in KwaZulu-Natal, we're always looking to attract investment into the province. Um, that's, so that's one of the main reasons for establishing the fund, for creating the fund, um, so that we can attract as many productions to come into the province as, pos as possible. Um, so we do have our different caps uh, for all the different categories. Um, it, it also includes animation, which I wish I, which I didn't speak about. Um, so from 1.5 million uh, for a feature film um, and really um, anything down to in the development phase, uh, 200,000. So we fund development funding, we fund production funding, we also fund uh, marketing and distribution funding, um, as well as, um, you know, markets and festivals and so on for, for exhibition. 
We have adopted the, the tier system. Um, this is something that has been developed um, at, a, at, a, at a national level. Um, I think most, if not all, of the funders are using the tier system. So this is basically where you tier, you know, filmmakers from from one to five, and you know, based on that, you you, you know, you take a, a decision on the the level of funding that they that they're able to to receive. So um, that is essentially uh, what we do. We also, um, in terms of the conditions of the fund, and I think it's important to explain this. Um, so how we attract the investment into the province is that we look at 50% uh, of the entire budget, the total budget, not what we fund, but the total budget being spent in the province of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, and that is the, the basis on which we, we take a decision. Now, in production funding, um, basically um, anyone from anywhere in the country can apply for funding to the KZN Film Commission. Um, so you don't have to be resident in KZN, you don't have to be uh, from KZN, as long as you spend 50% of your production budget in the province. But for development funding, Funding, however, um, you know, we've had to change that in the last, at least the last year, uh, where you actually do have to be resident or, or in fact, you have to be resident in KZN to qualify for, for development funding. It wasn't open previously, um, but what we found was that, um, you know, filmmakers that were not resident in the province, they, they, they really struggled to, to meet the 50% requirement um, for, for local spend. So we've now um, just made that for, for um, filmmakers who are resident in the province of, uh, of course, in the Telford development, but for production, it's, um, it's still open, provided you spend 50% uh, of, your, of your budget in the province. And I think broadly, um, the, the, those, are the, those are the main points of the, of the fund. Just a quick question to clarify, Jackie, you spoke about 50% being spent in KZN. Is this 50% of the entire budget um, that a producer would have raised um, for their production? Or is it 50% of the KZN budget that would then be funded to top up on other funded, um, other budgets that one would have raised? So this is 50% um, of, the, of the entire budget. So it's not our portion. So say, for instance, we give an award for 1.5 million to a film. We're not looking at 50% at of the 1.5 million. We're looking at the 50% of the, of the entire budget. Um, so any other finances that were, that were raised for the project, um, we're looking at 50% 50, 50 of that budget being, 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 being spent in the province. Um, what we do when we award funding, we allow, um, you know, a six-month period, you know, for filmmakers to raise finance, because obviously when they come to us, they haven't got all their, all their finance in place. So we allow six months, you know, for the filmmakers to, to raise that finance. As a documentary filmmaker, I can't help but still stay on this question. Um, what is the capped amount for feature documentaries? For feature documentaries, our cap is uh, 800,000. Thank you. Um, yeah. Christy, Yolanda, um, anyone comfortable with just making this conversation further in terms of what is it that is different that the, you know, the National Film and Video Foundation does? And, and I think there are a lot of similarities um, here and there, and there's also things that set each other, um, each of the funding bodies apart. Um, where, where do the stakeholders come together? But let's first talk about your funding model at the NFEF. Um, Yolanda, you wanna lead? Um, okay, cool. Um, so the National Film and Video Foundation funds across the value chain. We fund from development. We fund the development of scripts um, across different genres, um, documentaries, animation, and, and uh, narrative. Uh, we fund production. Um, and then we fund training for students that are studying towards um, a, a film degree. We fund marketing and distribution for the films that have been completed and the filmmakers are trying to find ways of marketing them. We fund, we fund the money for that. We then also fund um, 
towards uh, filmmakers being able to travel to festivals. Um, from a CAP point of view, I think we are in a space where we've just reviewed our CAPs as they were. Um, I think last month um, we launched the new CAPs um, to coincide with the current call that just closed on, on Sunday. Um, and what we have done is we looked at the fact that we had not been able to increase the caps amounts for a very long time. So right about now, we've increased the caps by a certain percentage, and it varies from um, from one um, tier to the next tier, I think, obviously. But with the emerging tier being the tier three, we've um, we've kept the, the, the caps the same. But for tier two and tier three across production and development, um, including training and all, we've increased our caps by a certain amount. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Yolanda. I just, um, I, I would like to mention that the DFA engaged with the NFVF earlier this year to flag some areas where we believed that the fund could be better structured to answer to the needs of documentary filmmakers, especially with regards to application processes and the structuring of the release of funds in the contracts. Um, and and, and I, I wouldn't be a good board member if I didn't mention how grateful we are for the prompt response and the willingness from the NFVF side to engage on part of, of and uh, forward uh, in terms of the documentary funding with this regard. Um, our concerns were taken to council and, you know, we still look forward to some responses on some things, but there already has been some announcements that have left us um, wanting for more and quite pleased. So, yes, thank you. Um, Desmond. Uh, can, thank you. Uh, can, Take us through through your funding model, please. All right. No, thank you. I think as with uh, the NFDF and KZN, we also work across the whole value chain uh, with regards to our funding structure, where for pre-production, we look at development funding, where we are able to assist filmmakers with that as well. And uh, we also, within the development space, the pre-production is also skills development, the element of training for accredited and non accredited training programs and and obviously working as a commission working around issues of locations assisting even documents of filmmakers to secure locations and also production as well we we also do fund across the three tiers but our strongest focus as the gfc uh, seeing that it's more developmental, it's more around tier two and three with regards to actual funding for 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 those projects. But however, even for tier one, we still we assist we still assist them as well. And then we also still do uh, post production funding, uh, which is available distribution, marketing, and film festivals. Uh, so in a nutshell, I mean uh, we all have almost a similar structure of how we operate. The difference is the caps, uh, because uh, budget, you know, sometimes you also are relied on budget that you are provided. And so our caps, I think for featured for now, I think due to budget constraints, I mean, I think for a document, I think we're sitting at 300,000 as opposed to eight that the KZN offers. But I mean, we're still trying to push to, to get more. Thank you. Um. We, we will hold you to the <laughs> trying to push to get more, and we're hoping it will be soon at Desmond. Um, you, you, you haven't touched on, on the part about spending in housing. Do you have that as a criteria? Is it an issue? Uh, I mean, I think if you I mean, if a firm is shot in Houghton, we don't really determine if you're outside of the province, because we know that even for equipment, you would still get equipment from Houghton for So our focus, we don't have the necessary care, but would advise that at least either post-production is done in Houghton or the actual principal photography. Uh, so because it still gives business to the province. So we are not that particular with regard to ensuring that how much percentage uh, of content must be shot in Gauteng. Uh, so we've done projects where you'd find that the Gauteng uh, production company like uh, White Wedding, uh, it was shot in the Bobo, but because it was a production company from Gauteng, we were able to assist them 
with regards to post-production because they went to Limpopo to shoot and then came back to shoot in Gauteng. So as long as there's a benefit for Gauteng, uh, we, we always encourage that uh, as, as a province. Jackie touched on um, giving giving filmmakers a period of preparation. Um, and I think this is a question all of you are very familiar with, turnaround times. It, it is quite a big issue in terms of when people submit and when things start happening. Um, and I'm back at you, Desmond. This is this is with regards to GFC. I, I know that once we put this up on social media, people were inboxing and saying, please ask the GFC to clarify when it comes to their actual processes and timelines. Um, and actually, where, where applications are supposed to be directed to. I know it sounds it sounds quite mediocre that we are asking those type of questions, but people are very unclear about how to apply to the GFC and what that process entails in terms of timelines and the response rate seems to be quite an issue. Oh, yes. Um, I I think we've met all those concerns. Uh, hence, we are just we've just completed our funding policy, uh, which would then be uploading probably by mid September. It would be in all our platforms. However, because we're offering it as a grant, and so you then find that we our turnaround is that the projects committee would sit once a quarter. So it means four times a year, every three months, there would be a committee where people are presenting, and then who in terms of applications is that uh, there is an application form within our website uh, so we did not have deadlines in terms of submission dates of call for submissions because this is mainly our funding mostly as GFC is mostly a top up so if you want to restrict someone to a particular time you'd find that they would have been funded by KZN and yet they have a shortfall so they can still come to GFC after they've met the criteria of either KZN or NFVF. So hence we sit every three months for, for, for a project review uh, and then you can submit at any time. So that has been a challenge because then it affects in terms of turnaround because it wasn't communicated quite clearly. Uh, so you'd find that maybe the second month of the quarter a GFC would sit and have a project commit. So if someone applies maybe on the 15th when the committee has concluded on the 14th, so it means you'd wait more for, for, for longer. So I think that has been realized. Hence, we are going to be releasing our firm funding policy and also in uh, stating submission dates and when the committee would be sitting so that everyone that wants to apply would know when to apply. Thanks, Desmond. Kirsty, does the NFEF have um, that level of transparency in terms of communicating when there would be seatings and when information will be released in terms of those that are awarded and those that are not awarded? Because I think I'm, I'm trying to make everybody um, um, echo the sentiments around people need to know when they would get responses. So in many instances, if, if there's always a very generic um, type of communication around, we'll sit um, when this tire is, has been submitted, but there is no follow through in terms of, this is how long the sittings will be, this is by when we will have responded, it, 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 it casts a lot of frustration on filmmakers, especially those that have deadlines around their films. Is there that level of transparency with the NFEF? Um, I would say, yes, there is a level of transparency. Um, within our new funding policy, um, we go into a little bit more detail about the application um, process. And um, I think with the, the cycle that was released, we brought one of our cycles uh, forward earlier due to COVID-19. And um, yeah, I mean, we managed to um, actually award grants to a normal um, 
what we would award in the year. So I think there from a communication process, I don't think anybody expected the amount of applications, but we did try to inform people of where we were in the process because obviously, um, you know, each application is evaluated by um, panel members and um, then that listing goes forward to, to our council. So, and from the council making the recommendations, they should then be released seven days later. But I think this was a sort of an exception to the norm. Um, and Yolanda could probably um, speak of sort of like the normal amount of applications that we would, uh, we would receive. But I think this year with COVID-19, uh, we, yeah, I think the team hit the ground running and I think they did their best to communicate to the industry what was hap happening as well. Um, we have but, a question. Oh, sorry, you were still saying, Kirsty? I can say, but um, a lot of information about the procedures are also available to filmmakers to look on, on the website as well. And that can also take you through the procedures that should be followed. Okay, thank you. Um, Liani Mastop has sent a question. Uh, it says, which of the funders provide funding for, one, designing, two, implementing impact campaigns? And she requests, please detail who or which productions would be eligible and how does the application process work with whoever that then provides that type of funding? Um, the question is quite long. It also adds what post-impact reporting do they require? So I'm, I'm just going to open it up to anyone who does funding for designing or and implementing impact campaigns. Jackie, is this something you guys look at? Uh, is funding specific to 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 genres or 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 campaigns, or is it? So far, my understanding has been that we've got fiction and nonfiction. You know, um, and in nonfiction, there can be a social impact campaign within the nonfiction work, as much as the fiction can also be scripted that way. Is this something that stands out on its own? Uh, we 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 don't fund campaigns uh, per se. You know, um, we this is something it's something that we don't do. Um, we have been approached, for instance, by by NGOs who are wanting to look for support. Um, if, if I'm hearing the question rightly, um, and yeah, it's 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 um, it's un unfortunately something that we that we don't that we don't fund. Unless you know there is a, a topic you know within a documentary or or a, a short film, for instance, that, that that speaks to a particular issue, um, then obviously that then becomes content. It becomes part of the story. But campaigns to say we we don't fund. Thank you. Yes, one. How do inform commission campaigns? Um, not necessarily. I think unless you're doing it as an audience development initiative where for a particular film that you've produced, you now want to take that film to the masses to use it to maybe convey a particular message. That I think we can look at. But specifically, campaign that doesn't involve form, we don't uh, do that. Okay. And Yolanda? Yolanda, you're on mute. Kindly unmute yourself. Thanks. Um, I I would also say we don't necessarily fund um, campaign uh, really, but I think we also very much aware of how you know the 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 world of documentary um, is evolving and how impact uh, films are now like they being produced more and there's a drive towards having uh, films that have an, a campaign or an impact campaign. So I think, I mean, if it if it's part of the content of the film, um, then those are the things that can be considered um, within the, obviously the production funding that we do. But it also it's it's also about how like because they, we also have marketing that does marketing um, funding, and I think it's also about how it's structured. But I don't want to necessarily say we do fund um, campaigning, but I think um, within even the marketing uh, uh, the marketing 
funding, depending on how one structures it, um, it is part of audience. Uh, it is part of audience development. It is part of getting your film out there and getting it noticed. So it's just about how you structure it. So if it's about getting eyeballs on the film and getting it out there, um, while well, there's a certain message that you're creating, that that's I think, um, yeah. It, it, it would be possible, but I'm not saying we do find it, but I think it would really depend on the structure and how um, it's executed. So uh, <laughs> anonymous attendee has asked a question. Thanks, thanks Yolanda for clarifying and Jackie with Desmond on that one. Um, there's a strange situation in the Western Cape. They don't have a film commission anymore and Westgro doesn't seem to provide direct financial support. Certainly not for emerging first-time filmmakers. Um, is there anyone who can give advice for them? I'm assuming the person who sent this question is an emerging filmmaker. Um, and what is the solution? I'm going to direct it to the NFEF. Um, oh, the from I mean we 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 fund nationally, so we as long as you're within the borders of South Africa, you are eligible for our funding, and you're South African, um, or have citizenship. So I think if you are in Cape Town and you are emerging and you want our funding, you do qualify for our funding. And also, if there are things that I mean, I do understand that sometimes emerging filmmakers do have questions that they want to pose. I think we do have a team that does help and assist with questions that you may have, but it also helps if you do it, you know, way before time. I think um, ordinarily our our application dates are communicated way in advance. We fund three times a year and those dates are communicated quite clearly. So it's about, you know, knowing when the application date is and then communicating and asking all the right questions beforehand. Um, and the team will try their utmost best to to assist. Um, if it's something that the applications team is not able to help in, it's something that they would bring into our team to then still be able to assist. But it's about asking for that help beforehand. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to COVID-19 funding. Um, to those that are attending this session, kindly know that I see your questions on chats and in the q and I will be um, sampling some of them as we go along. I'm not ignoring any questions, but we do need to get to, to the COVID-19 funding. Unati, you've been quiet um, because you're not a funding body. You do not represent a funding body. Um, and this is where we will be roping you in. Um, let, let's start with uh, Kirsty. Kirsty, you touched on um, having had to shift things around. COVID comes and everybody doesn't expect it and everybody is in panic, but the shows have to go on. But other things also have to be implemented and we have to almost trial and error as we go. What has the NFEF put in place um, to deal with COVID-19 in terms of funding? Um, normally, our cycle one um, funding would open in May. So what the NFVF did was basically they brought the funding forward and the cycle actually opened earlier in um, towards the end of March and was open until uh, mid-April. So basically what they did was they focused on um, development, um, archive funding and post-production. So the, the focus was on things that could still be done sort of within the constraints of either, you know, a home environment. So, and then um, we've now opened our cycle two um, application. Well, that opened in at the end of July and that closed then on the 23rd of August. And um, again, this was open to all different tiers, but we've also brought back production into the equation as well. So it was basically addressing our, our cycles and bringing them forward and hoping to still be able to um, to give grants out during this area, during this time. Um, can we touch on the relief fund that yes. uh, NFEF yes. has? So we've just recently, um, at the beginning of August, we've um, announced a relief fund. So that's basically aimed at supporting independent freelance practitioners, technical production crews in film and television industry 
who have either been affected or even infected by, you know, COVID-19. So um, it's a 5 million rand fund that's basically got a cap of 10,000. There is a criteria um, of who is eligible for it. Um, and all those details are actually, I mean, they were posted on our social media. So for everybody that's listening, I would just say um, within NFEF, they're very good at posting on um, whether it's Twitter, whether it's on Instagram, and keeping all their followers abreast of um, all the funding that's that's available. But I, it's also good also to go to the website as well, and all of the details are always there on who is applicable and um, you know what you need to do in order to ap uh, apply. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, Onati, so Sasfed. Um, is not a funding body. And from what you introduced SASFED to be, how does SASFED fit into um, COVID funding conversation? Well, SASFED is a federation of um, industry bodies, uh, production bodies across the value chain. By that we mean from writers to producers to actors to editors. Um, animators, um, sisters working in film and television. So we represent, you know, some of the recipients of the funding that we've been talking about. Obviously, the majority of people working in the sector are freelancers. They were catered for in any funding. And so we had to stay in because jobs have stopped immediately. People were enjoying their time at home watching content oblivious to the fact that the actual content makers were out of jobs, jobs had stopped, they were um, at a loss of income. So that's where we then tried to set something up. Um, initially, it should be a screen sector fund, but of course we don't have the infrastructure as SASFED. We have two staff members. Um, we don't have the infrastructure to disperse, um, et cetera. So we had to look for a funding administrator partner which we then chose Chikululu, who is very well versed in this type of thing. We also got, ahead, um, got hold of Grey Global as international partners to start knocking on international doors on our behalf. Um, so that is the effort that we have put in. I don't know if you want me to go into more detail, um, but that's so we obviously last month we announced our first funding partner, the world's leading uh, streaming um, platform, Netflix, came on board. Um, they donated 8.3 million to help our freelancers. Um, I think it's a great sign of solidarity with our industry. It's a sign to say South African content is important. We believe in the crew, we believe in the talent. And so that is the first partner and we're still knocking on other doors um, to get other relief fund partners. Um. The mention of the 8.3 million um, partnership or that came out of, of SASFED's work with Netflix makes one want to ask ways that in terms of dispersing the funds, um, is it closed? Is it going to have rounds like the DISAC Relief Fund is now on its second round? Is this similar or, or different? This is a once-off grant. Um, already we had far more applications than the monies could actually cater for because this particular fund um, had promised to give 15,000 rands per um, if, if, if you're approved. So um, we're hoping, you know, we've now set up a structure that's almost like an umbrella structure. So each fund will come in, each partner with their own requirements, will attend to those requirements and we'll deal with each fund in a separate um, kind of bubble, but under the umbrella. Um, so they are not dispersing it. I think there's the panel is going through the applications now. Um, it is a one sort of fund. Um, we are trying to, like I said, knock on more doors. We also talking to other established funds so that if they have second rounds, then we can influence the kind of criteria that they are using because the crux of all these relief funds is in the criteria. I might sound a bit um, pushy with this similar same question, and I will ask it to everyone. Do you have any idea 
when the disbursement will start? Um, the disbursement is supposed to start as soon as possible. So as they are approving, they are disbursing. We're not waiting for an end date to then um, disperse. So the applications have closed. The panelists are going through the applications, but as you're being approved, so they will disperse. Okay. Thanks, Anati. Um, Desmond, do you have, does, does GFC have a COVID-19 relief fund set up? And if so, how does that work? And where is it? Uh, GFC, uh uh, has the fund, but however, through the Department of Sports, Recreation, Arts, and so the provincial department has set aside 50 million uh, relief fund towards sports, arts, and culture uh, projects. So the cap, I stand to be corrected, was between six and ten million, six thousand and ten. Uh, per applicant that they were going to be granted. So the first call, I think, closed uh, three weeks ago. So they are going through the adjudication process, and it looks like they did not get enough. Uh, so they would then reopen, a date of which would then be announced by the MEC, uh, so that then they can reissue. So on that note, I think we were engaging with SASFED to then say for the second call, because they did engage uh, GFC to then say the criteria that was put, because it was a generic criteria that spoke to arts and culture and poets and everything. And then SASFED did raise concerns to say, maybe let us look into advising on how we can assist in the second run, maybe for the criteria. So that I think would we'll still do uh, once we are clear how much they have been dispersed. Uh, but however, the fund is is closed. They're going through adjudication process. Thanks, thanks, Desmond. Kirsty, just before I go to Jackie on their relief fund, if they do have one, do you have um, kept amounts that will be paid out? So uh, DSEC was paying out either what people were earning, but they kept it at 20K. Um, Netflix kept at 15. Desmond just said, you know, it's between six and 10. What is the end of year if one kept it? It's 10,000. 10,000. Okay, thank you. Um, Jackie, do you, does the KZN Film Commission have a COVID 19 relief fund set up and how is it working? Is it still open criteria and payout amounts? Um, so, so we have a, a relief fund. Um, I think it probably works slightly, slightly differently um, to the others. So, what what has happened? Obviously, with our projects that we were funding, you know, some of them were about to go into production. Everything stopped with um, with COVID. Now they have to gear themselves up to to go into production, and you know, obviously, now suddenly they have all these additional costs that they have to take into consideration. You know, because of the you know all the, all the safety issues on set. So we've then had to, um, we've secured um, a relief fund for, for those projects. It's in the region of, um, of 23 projects um, that are going to be going into, into production. Um, so we are, you know, training the safety officers, um, you know, for those productions. We're providing all the PPE um, equipment uh, for those productions. Um, that there are protocols, um, and 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 our team is working very closely, you know, with assisting the productions in in in, in creating that additional fund. So basically, costing those uh, those items, um, and we are initially going to train six um, safety officers that will go um, and work and, and work with those teams. We'll also be doing um, inspections on the on the various sets, you know, just to make sure that everything is going um, according to plan. So that is what we've um, we've, we've got in place in terms of a relief. Um, what we've what we're also doing, and which we're going to announce shortly, is um, just to um, stimulate activity in the province because you know people have been, uh, you know, sitting at home for the last five to six months. We are going to make a call for special COVID-related uh, projects, uh, projects that um, speak to the COVID-19 theme. Um, that'll be uh, documentaries and shorts. Um, so we're looking at three documentaries, three short films, 
is um, the, the, the theme of COVID-19. So that's a special call that we're going to be um, putting out this year um, as a relief, you know, to, to industry and to stimulate uh, some production activity in the province. Um, we also um, are looking at the fact that most of the markets and festivals are virtual. I mean, we're speaking virtually um, today. And so we, we, we see that as, a, as an opportunity that is an opportunity for filmmakers to access festivals that they wouldn't have been able to access in the, you know, um, otherwise. Um, and the, the fees for most of those registration fees are, are reduced. Um, so we've also got a fund, you know, for filmmakers to apply to attend those festivals. We'll also be posting that, um, you know, quite soon to say as a, as a relief. It just obviously helps um, filmmakers to access access those uh, those platforms, uh, access the networks, and you know potential, I guess, um, you know, funding at those platforms as well. So those are the three really uh, um, you know initiatives that we put in place uh, at the Film Commission. Anonymous is saying one would argue uh, based on not being certain how many um, um, filmmakers are funded by the KZN Film Commission that um, funding for PPE um, might be minimalistic in terms of what is being released. Um, and us being on level two um, means that, you know, COVID is becoming manageable as much as it hasn't gone away. Um, you, you touched on the fact that you're stimulating and looking at generating um, COVID-19 projects um, to, to direct some of the money there. I think the question that is being asked is, because there is a need, because there is more demand for relief fund, um, would the KZN Film Commission consider funding like uh, KZN and GFC or funding like the NFVF so that there is enough supply for those that are looking for relief fund, other than just the filmmakers that are being funded on 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 COVID within the productions that are already good, are going yes, on. No. Yes. Um, well, no. Thanks for that. You know, um, our fund is, is 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 quite limited, and 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 we actually did consider a a relief fund of of of, of some sort. Um, but when we looked at the need just for the projects that we're that we're managing, um, you know, we really didn't have much um, left over, if you like, to to have a general relief fund. It was on our on our plan, but it's one of the things that unfortunately we had to let go because we had to look after the, the filmmakers that initially need to go into production immediately, and they obviously haven't budgeted for any um, you know. Uh, PPE items or security offices and things like that. So that's what we, we prioritize for now. There's a question from Pablo Pinedo from the Western Cape who says, does it need, I, I think he's asking about funding models to say the people who qualify for applications for funding to any of the funding bodies that are here, um, are they supposed to be permanent residents or does citizenship play a role? Can they be permanent residents being non-South Africans? Do they qualify? NFEF? Within our funding policy, both permanent residents and citizens, um, you know, can apply as long as they've got the, you know, necessary supporting documentation which is part of the application process. Okay, okay. And Desmond, that will be the same with you, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. Can, can we talk a bit about festivals um, in terms of, there's been a lot of webinars um, that have, have had money put into them. Some have been through people volunteering. Um, Jackie has just spoken about you know, uh, reduced registration fees for festivals. Is the NFVF or the GFC looking at funding COVID-19 new concept type of festivals? Um, how are you participating in that space in terms of funding? Um, with regards to the festivals, I think uh, festivals such as Encounters, um, we've still been able to, to support them. I think obviously, 
what they've had to do is change um, around their plans to then migrate into a, an, a virtual festival. But I think what the, um, what the other thing that we we did was we released a call for drive-ins um, uh, where people can apply. We've that call was closed. We currently. Uh, doing the evaluations right now where companies that um, that would have initially done traditional festivals, they're doing drive-ins. Um, that is what we are doing. And then I think from obviously a festival attendance, we we understand that all the festival have gone online. Um, what we've done is we've actually allowed filmmakers to be part of the process. We've released calls where we were giving people data and paying accreditation. So if you wanted to participate in the festival, but uh, surprisingly enough, the, um, the applications have been very low uh, when it gets to that, because I think we wanted people to be able to experience, um, you know, festivals, i.e. in counties and able to watch films without the burden of, uh, of data and diff and any other international festival. But the, the application have been really, really low. Um, uh, and I'm not certain why, but I think from those are the two things that we are doing from an audience point of view and festival attendance, or at least trying to drive audiences towards content. Thanks. I know that um, Kirsty touched on people being directed to social media as well as the NFVF website for information. But Cheryl has just asked, and she's aware that the NFVF just had a cycle for funding that closed on Sunday. She's asking when do they anticipate that it will be? This information might be on the website, but I think, can we engage her? And she's asking, will documentary be part of the cycle again as they focused on this area in the last round? Okay. Um, I think as Kirsty has already indicated, what we've had to do as part of our response to the COVID, I think as soon as we knew that there was a lockdown, we looked at what could be done and we brought forward what like um, a call that would have happened um, in June, we brought it forward to, to March. Um, and right now we're sitting on our current call, which will then the results will come out in December and we're still going to have our third call. What I'm not able to confirm is um, will documentaries be there? I think like in the last cycle, we received so many applications and because we understand the climate that we were in, we were, um, we were not as stringent in the funding. So we tried to give in as much as we could. So basically all the development money that we had, um, we tried to disperse it as much as we can to cover ground in terms of projects and applicant, um, which is why right now the focus is um, the focus in the cycle um, for documentaries, it is still both fiction. I mean, it is still development and, and production, whereas for narrative, it is just uh, the production because we've exhausted our development funding when it gets to narrative. Um, right about now, we've just closed a call on Sunday and we are sitting with over 300 applications, almost 400 applications that we have to go through. Um, and we will do the same thing as we did last cycle. We will try and find as many people as possible. If it means we run out of money, at least we'll communicate that in time. But I think um, we will try. And if there's money left, we will release the third call with the third call, which will be in December, as always scheduled. It will. It's always in December. It's it's August, and then it's June. So our our dates don't change every year. They're basically the same. What we did change this year was the first two calls because of uh, because of the COVID. And usually we take about four months turnaround. Um, where a call that is released in December, the results will be known by March. Um, yeah, I hope I've answered everything of the the person was asking. Sure. You have. You have. Um, Capacity, the, the, the issue of turnarounds um, and, and the response rate, as you touched so well on the Desmond, um, talks to capacity. Um, are our funding bodies equipped enough? Um, do they have the right capacity or enough capacity 
to handle the demand, you know, and 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 whatever the answer will be, how does that get dealt with if there is intervention that needs to happen? I'm going to start with Desmond. Um, I think the issue of capacity is always a challenge, especially when it comes to a budget, uh, because when you look at uh, a province like Gauti, is that even pre-COVID, is that you then find that the, most of the budget for the province goes to education and hospitals because of the issue of migration. Then it then affects how much institutions like GFC are then granted, which then causes a challenge when it comes to grant funding, because then because you, are, you have a limited budget, you are unable to service the whole industry. And with Gauteng being one of the biggest provinces with regards to production, then as province, you are unable to, 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 to assist. So it is something that we are working hard towards ensuring solution, what we, we cannot always be sitting in these spaces and talk about the problems. Um, people always want to hear commitment to change and, and what will be put in place when for this to change, because it does affect eventually the value chain. Um, it does affect when people deliver, it does affect when, if people do finish their films, um, if capacity remains a problem, we don't seem to have a a proper solution for? It, it, I mean, from our side, I think we are also engaging other, other agencies like your Houghton Tourism Agency and other institutions to, to then say maybe when it comes to uh, support, we can maybe collaborate and also go out and talk to private sector as well, because there are certain uh, product placement also ensure that we push those aspects so that there's enough funding because what we have realized is that uh, as much as uh, there's budget but there's limited budget from government so it is for us as the GFC especially within this new administration is that they then wanted to move ahead in ensuring that we bring in private sector to also see how far uh, they can support the industry but also involve agencies like tourism because you're going to be shooting a film in Houghton, you are using locations, so you are already selling uh, the province. So obviously you can look into ensuring that you get some element of funding. Issues of hospitality uh, groups, how do you then work with them so that it reduces uh, the, the budget or, or the burden for the production companies? Is, is, I'm not questioning the plan of, of partnering and working with tourism. I'm asking if the issue of capacity is something that, and maybe Unati can also come in here. Um, is this something that requires beefing up staff first internally? Is there that kind of problem with our film commissions or our funding bodies? Would you say at GFC there needs to be enough capacity within GFC first um, before partnering, because sometimes it, these frustrations around response rate and how long uh, the duration taken to adjudicate and go through allude to people believing that there isn't enough people um, or panelists or setting aside of funds to create the panels that actually can focus on adjudication who are part of the industry or not. Is that for Desmond or me? <laughs> Anyone who wants to come <laughs> in with we can talk to it. <laughs> for the, you know, the way we see it, um, there's, there's a definite lack of capacity and capacitating. Um, but there's another side of industry that thinks, for example, that the NFEF is too bloated and that they should, you know, there's no recognition of the fact that it services nationally and the staff has actually not grown from when the NFEF used to collect manual applications to electronic ones. So there's always this, this tug and pull. Um, but I do think, I know from an organizational point of view, being at SASFED, the fact that, 
you know, we are a federation of volunteer organizations. Um, people are doing this over and beyond the use. These organizations need capacitating. So I think capacity is always, and, and budget is a reason for why we lack capacity, but we've got to work beyond that. You know, we've got to find a way of actually servicing who we are there to service. As a lobbyist in, in Sasford, um, Unati, is there, is there direct intentions to influence this capacitating? You know, I know it's a Cash 22 situation because on the one hand, filmmakers would rather have all the money directed to funding their films, right? At the same time, they are the same filmmakers who we are frustrated when we don't get the response rate that we want, when we don't get the attention that we believe we deserve. Um, how does SASFED come to lobby for that capacitating at higher level? I'm talking, does it need to be taken up to DISAC to say, look, you need to ensure that they are, the funding bodies are capacitated? Um, what is being done? Is there something being done? We have definitely raised the issue. We've raised the issue in respect of the DSAC funding itself, which took months, the first round, which took months to, 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 to disperse. So we then, um, you know, put names forward to amplify the adjudication panel because relief is relief and relief is supposed to be urgent. So, the, you know, even with their own funding, we, we said something. We've raised it with DSAC also to say that, you know, this, this industry, in order to move to the next level, we need to capacitate organizations. We need to capacitate the entities. The entities need to be working efficiently. Um, in our view, the NFVF doesn't, um, you know, how it implements its mandate is a lot more narrower than what the NFEF Act says. So we are having those discussions um, together within SASFED as well as with stakeholders. Okay, thank you. Jackie, is capacity an issue for the KZN Film Commission? Um, look, I think it is a it is a concern. Um, the fund is growing. We're receiving more applications. Um, you know, as, as people become more aware of the fund. I mean, every time we open the funding cycle, we get more applications. You know, it's just just a, it's just a growing fund. Where we're able to cope uh, at the moment, our turnaround time is is three months. Um, so we are able to cope. Every now and again, we bring in. Attempts, if we need to, um, but you know, I think as as um, you know, previous speakers have said, you know, you have to look at the, you know, the the salary bill. You can only have you know so many um, you know individuals working within an organisation. You can't all be um, administrators. Um, so it's um, yeah, it's, it's it's a bit of a quick pro. pro. We, we you know, it's it's a, a challenge that I think will will be there for us and maybe other agencies for, for a while. But we are at least, you know, able to, to, to stay within our, our turnaround time. And I think that's the thing that, um, that, gives, us, uh, that gives us comfort with the coping for now. Yolanda, is there a link for festival attendance support? Um, Leanne is asking if there is a link and where can it be found for people to apply for festival, festival attendance support? Um, so if you go onto our website, there's like a green little bar at the top um, that's for all applications that are currently active. I do know that the applications for DFM um, have closed because it is closer as well as TIFF. But um, if you go into our Praxis system and onto our website, you should be able to see what festivals um, you can apply for. Okay. But any uh, festival happening in September is closed. I'm, 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 I'm scared to Desmond and I'm looking for the question on my phone because I know that last night it was beeping and somebody sent me a, a question. Um, the question to Desmond was, do you publish your recipients um, of, of your grant? 
Um, and when, if you do, um, is it on your website? Uh, it's not on our website, but it's on our annual report. So on an annual report, we then issue a list of uh, projects that we have funded. But uh, like I mentioned earlier, is that we are, we are going to be announcing our funding policy. So on a quarterly basis, we are now going to then announce those that have been funded on a, on a quarter. Okay. Jackie, the, the, there is several messaging coming through around the frustration of the 50% spend in KZN. Um, people want to know if there would ever be consideration of cross provinces or even um, um, cross country work that, that the quotas around the 50% could possibly be reviewed because they do want to tap into the KZN Film Commission money, um, but the the quotas, the fifty percent quotas, seem to be quite limiting um, uh, in terms of then wanting to come through and work in KZN. Is there a consideration to discuss this and see if there can be maybe fifty percent and certain specific scenarios that are justifiable and criteria set to have maybe 25% expenditure or less, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, um, you know, 50% uh, um, spend in KZN actually means that you can access the maximum cap on our, on our film fund. But if you do come into KZN and we do award you funding and you spend less than 50% in the province, we will then, our rebate then becomes 25%. So we will then fund you, um, you know, 25% of what you spend in KZN. So we, we do have that 25% consideration, but you obviously won't be able to access the maximum uh, cap uh, within that particular genre. So the, 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 oh, sorry, I just need to make sure that the sound goes off. Just a second. Okay, there we are. Um, so the 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 Unati, I'm I'm going to rope you in on this one because we we always find KZN Film Commission obviously caters mostly for filmmakers who would be in KZN or anyone who would be then filming in KZN and investing in KZN. Uh, or bringing their 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 production fund certain quotas to KZN. Cutting from commission is not too restrictive. NAVF says nationwide we don't have enough film commissions in terms of our provincial breakdown. Um, is SASFED's role trying to be uh, to to see or to bring together all the stakeholders around? I'm talking funding bodies and seeing how we can bridge the gap. Um, and, and this will talk to obviously the double dipping around um, COVID relief fund to say what is being put in place, I'm planting the seed to the funding bodies, what is being put in place to avoid double dipping because it's easy for others to be paid um, by DSEC and by Gauteng Film Commission and by NFEF all at once. Um, and in some cases, it might not have been intentional. It's because of when the fund, the funds were open and people were trying everywhere, you know, and then the funds just happened to all come at the same time. So is Sasford working on finding the synergy around the funding bodies? Um, and, and if that is, where is that at this point in time? Right, so because of COVID, our attention has primarily been relief. Relief and uh, re-stimulating the economy afterwards. So in, again, in terms of relief, um, it was important that we use the existing structures, so where the film commissions are now, and that we aim to influence how and the reach of their, of, of, of their relief funds, right? Um, that was the short-term plan. The long-term plan is, is obviously a concern that um, 
you know, that, that we don't have film commissions um, everywhere. And uh, the, the filmmaker in Mbapo, um, what what is he or she doing? What support does he or she have? I know that the NFEF does their tours or rounds, or but it's not enough. We do need an infrastructure that is national, and we certainly will be engaging. Um, I've brought we've brought the topic up. It's for discussion amongst SASFED members. Um, and we certainly, after that, will be coming up with a plan to then engage with stakeholders. Okay. Um, Desmond, <laughs> Desmond, yeah. can you can you just um, clarify in terms of of timelines? Because the, I know we we seem to be cycling on some things that we would have touched on, but the questions come in, and I'm assuming it's people who would have joined us a bit late and they, they don't know where we are. So I'm just going to mention what I remember and what I had noted down, that the NFVF um, relief fund applications are closing on the 3rd of September. Am I right, Kirsty? Um, and the amount that has been set aside by the NFVF is 5 million. And then Netflix fund has closed which is 8.3 million, which was going to pay out 15,000 per person. Um, and then the Gauteng one um, has not had a big response. So there will be a second round call, right? The 50 million. I, Unati, can you just talk about the DISEC one? Because I know that that is still running or it has a second round coming. Um, so the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture um, did have a second round because precisely because the first round couldn't reach the intended beneficiaries. Um, we then engaged with them, uh, talked about criteria, um, talked about the entities helping only existing partners and existing productions and that the help needed to go further. So, um, and we influenced also the um, adjudication panel as well. So the DAC, and we also said um, we needed an appeal process because there'd been so much mess um, in terms of that. And then they did institute an appeal process. So the DAC then decided to do a second round. It's considerably different with the our criteria, the criteria now are not necessarily based on loss of income, which is the main thing we wanted to influence. Um, but also the, the I think they paid out 20,000 per person in the first round, and this round is 6,000 um, per applicant. So it's help. Um, obviously the kitty got smaller, um, but at least we're hoping that this will also reach wider um, with the, the, the criteria that's not based on loss of income. I'm not sure when that application process ends, but it is soon, but I know it is open now still. So people must apply. Okay. Um, just to, to, to correct that part, the DISAC funding was kept at 20K. It did not pay out everyone 20K. Um, the second round one, I, I know that the initial announcement was that it was going to be 2,200 per person over three months, which I think Sasford was lobbying to say, can it be a once-off fee of 6,600? That's also a capped amount. We don't know if they will be paying less, but capping it at 6,600. Um, so thanks, Unati. Um, I'm going to come to Kirsty to talk about the the... Slate, re, slate fund first, then we will talk to, about the slate relief fund. Um, how does the slate fund work? Um, and because this is a DEFA initiative, can I request that we start to talk about slate on the documentary side and be biased to the documentary people? <laughs> I'm actually going to ask, do you mind if I ask Yolanda, because I know that is her specialized area. So, I mean, there are three slates. We've got our documentary, and then we've got our women filmmaker and our youth filmmaker. But Yolanda can talk more to the, the documentary slate that's um, and how it works. Happiness. Yolanda? Um, just on the documentary slate, I think we have, we have all together about 
We have 10 slates all together as an organization. There's um, two of those slates are, 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 are targeted to developing filmmakers, which is the female filmmaker project as well as the youth filmmaker project. And then we've got three documentary slates and then the rest are narrative. Out of the three documentary slates, we've just approved one at the beginning of the year, and they're all at various stages. Millie um, is one of our slate beneficiaries. Um, and from the slates, they get to produce about, um, they get to develop about nine projects and produce three features at the end, um, at the end of the, of, of the project. Um, with the current slates, we've actually been very fortunate where we've had a broadcaster come on board um, to formulate, to be part of the, the, partner, the partners of the slate, um, where they almost matching our funding to 50-50. That has been very encouraging. And that came as a result of a very successful relationship um, with the other slates being the youth and the female. Um, the Slates funding are released every other three years, and the idea around slates is not is not the project per se, but it's the developing of the of the company itself. It's about trying to develop kind of companies that are that are sustainable, um, but also very much aware that the funding we give is not hundred percent. But what we are giving is money upfront so that then the company can go and raise additional funding elsewhere. But knowing that they do have a guarantee or they do have seed funding from the National Film and Video Foundation, with with the, with which then opens more doors uh, because we also understand that even when you go internationally, um, a lot of other funders, um, especially government funders, they do want to know that you do have funding from your own government before they can invest. So the idea around um, slate funding is to create companies that can co-produce with other. Uh, with other companies within South Africa, but co-produce internationally as well and find um, projects um, and produce them that are, um, you know, financially valuable, but also to produce things in bulk so that they actually do have an archive of content that they can, you know, they have a shelf of content that they can produce beyond the slate period. Um, and I think one of the, one of the things that we um, that we did do because the slate companies, it's about them also employing other people at the beginning of the lockdown. Um, we released about 500,000 for the slate companies to be able to stay afloat during the first three months of lockdown uh, because we understood that if we leave them to dry, then it doesn't really assist this entire notion of a sustainable company. Okay. So you had a second um, question. Sorry, I, I may have forgotten it. Uh, I, no, no, no. Um, the idea was to talk on slate funding, then come to COVID nineteen slate funding relief fund, um, which you did touch on. So it's it's okay. Yeah, and I think if I may just add. Oh, sorry. With the with the other production. I mean, with the other projects that we do find, we had given an opportunity at the beginning of the of lockdown to say, if you are pressed for funding and you do have an active project with the NAVF, however, you do need to unlock funding within your development or within your production funding. We do give like a once-off payment within your your the money that you have for your project, meaning that we give it uh, beforehand um, on a trust basis that um, you will deliver. Uh, after that, we've had a few filmmakers of our approaches, which we've then since released um, the the funds. Obviously, they do have to sign a commitment letter. Um, so that is another way where we've tried to keep the industry, I suppose, um, afloat within OS, you know, people getting money um, within the COVID period. Uh, I've been given a signal to, to wrap um, I, I would like to thank all the panelists. I know that this conversation could go on and on. I know that others are wondering why we have not had uh, conversations that cross to DTI and IDC. We do not have them on the panel. Um, but there's always more webinars that will host 
this kind of conversations. Um, I wish broadcasters, and I'm hoping they were listening in on these conversations because, you know, it's a, it's a chain of, of interconnectedness uh, when it comes to funding. Um, uh, uh, somebody wrote a note that said they are shocked they haven't seen any COVID-19 related work on our broadcasting platforms at this stage, you know, having had had COVID-19 for a couple of months, it's, it's a bit uh, disappointing that, you know, there isn't content that is directly talking to COVID-19 at this stage. But that said, I would like to thank Desmond Tembu from the Gauteng Film Commission, Kirsty Blackford from the National Film and Video Foundation, Jackie Matsebe from KZN Film Commission, Yolanda Nakotana from National Film and Video Foundation, as well as Unati Malunga, who is from South African Screen Federation. A special thanks to you to the DFA, um, as well as Encounters for hosting this. Thank you, Rodibu and Dijon. Oh, oh I'm on this fine. <laughs> oh, I, I was going to make an announcement, but it's fine. No, 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 go ahead. I don't, can